Hello everyone. Welcome to the fifth episode of Urban Log webinar series. I'm Archana Menon and I'll be a moderator for today's session. Today's episode is titled Debunking Parking Myths. As the title suggests, the discussion will focus on shattering some of the common misconceptions people have on on-street and off-street parking. We will also go into detail about the significance of the recent Supreme Court judgment mandating Delhi to maintain and manage parking on and off its streets. So welcome everyone to episode five. Today we have two panelists. Our first panelist is Ashwati Dilip, the Senior Program Manager of ITDP India program. Ashwati is a complete street and parking management expert. She leads she has led national, state, and city level policies and strategies on various on ground initiatives. Her most recent success being the adoption of the Complete Street Toolkit by Smart City Mission. Welcome, Ashwati. Our second panelist is Anumita Roy Chowdhury, Executive Director, Research and Advocacy for the Center of Science and Environment. She has worked extensively to build the Right to Clean Air campaign. She has also contributed to many policy wins, like including clean air action plans in cities and parking policy as a demand ma management tool. Welcome, Anumita. Welcome both the panelists to today's episode. Before we start, here's a broad structure of the webinar. Ashwati will lead the discussion with a short 15 to 20 minute presentation, followed by Anumita, after which we'll have the Q&A session. A few housekeeping rules. You can chat and interact with each other and the panelists in the chat box. Panelists, you're free to uh, answer questions or interact with our participants while the other is talking, if you're intrigued by a question. Um, but please remember to type the Q and A, uh, the questions in the Q and A box and not the chat box. These questions will be answered at the end of the discussion today. If you like a question, you can also upvote it. The question with the most votes will be answered. On that note, thank you all for joining in. Now I hand over the discussion to Ashwati, who can begin. Good evening, everyone. Firstly, thank you, Archana, for inviting me to this webinar. I'm very excited to join Anumita in this session. Diving straight into the topic of discussion, parking is an interesting and controversial topic. Over the last month, it has, we've been facing, or we've been happy to have various milestones with respect to parking, with the Supreme Court directing Delhi to notify its rules for parking in the national capital. Parking is today being discussed at various government offices discussed on television, press, and social media, and during our dinner discussions at home. I'm sorry, I'm... So in this presentation, I'd like to take you all through the challenges that cities face as a result of parking. Why is it important to resolve the issue of parking? What are some of the beliefs around parking? Let's understand the reality and demystify them. And finally, let's look at what cities should do as the next step. As you can see in this picture, parking in most Indian cities is unmanaged and half facade encroaching our footpaths and streets. This results in our vulnerable road users, such as pedestrians, cyclists, and public transport users, who also often walk for the last mile and first mile connectivity, having to wait precariously between fast moving traffic, putting their life in danger. And when we look at the mode share, it's important to understand the inequity of parking that the cars that cater to less than 10% of the trips in the city when not moving almost 90% of the time as parking tends to occupy as much as a quarter to half of our precious road space. 
Further, unregulated and free parking increases congestion and as a result pollution in our cities. As research shows that as much as 50% of traffic in our neighborhoods is caused by drivers looking around or driving around for free parking. But it's not just our footpaths and streets that have been taken over by parked cars, but more and more of our precious parks are now being paved to create parking. Just last week, the High Court in Chennai granted permission to create parking lots beneath parks as park and ride facilities. The picture on the right is of an eight acre park filled with more than hundreds of trees that has now been cleared as seen in the picture on the lower right end corner to create a park and ride facility. It has become a serious law and order issue in cities like Delhi. Police report states that this year, at least one person was killed every month. Yes, you heard me right. One person was killed every month in the capital because of parking related disputes. So parking is killing us, sometimes slowly, but other times immediately. Hence, it is very important for us to act now. But when it comes to action, we hear about decisions taken by various governments and judiciary in an attempt to improve the parking condition only to make matters worse. So let's take a look at our beliefs around parking and try to understand the reality. Firstly, parking is my birthright. Now, if I bought an air conditioner and complained that the government hasn't given me a free house to install it, doesn't that sound a bit bizarre to you? But we continuously find it perfectly all right to complain when we buy a new car that the government hasn't given me a free place to park it. And we not only require a free place in front of our residences, but also in front of our markets, in front of the hospitals that we visit, the malls, the restaurants, etc. So we need to understand that parking is a commodity. It's not a right. And it will and should come with a price. When we think about the parking problem in our cities, the first most immediate solution that comes to our mind is that we need more parking. More parking will definitely resolve and solve the problem of parking. However, parking in reality is like a huge magnet. A magnet that attracts more cars to it, which will need more parking, which further attracts more cars, leading to a vicious cycle. So let's look at the case of Copenhagen. Copenhagen in the 1950s, as a result of the increasing number of vehicles owned in the city, opted to create unlimited free on-street parking, followed by building off-street facilities, only to see more demand for parking. And hence, today, they've reversed their solution. They're looking to create and they, they've adopted tighter parking supply and regulations. Every year, Copenhagen now is reducing parking spaces by 2%. And when an off-street parking structure is built, on-street parking supply is removed and converted into cycle tracks, pedestrian areas, and bus lanes. And when we want to create more parking in our cities, the first easy solution is to create multi-level car parks. Today, as we speak, cities in the country are carrying out extensive studies to identify land parcels within the city center to create numerous multi-level car parks. More than thousands of crores are being allocated to such projects. But let's take a look at how MLCPs 
are being used in other cities across the country. Multi-level car parking facilities in Delhi are unused as people park free on the road. But this is not the case only in the national capital. More than 11 multi-story car parks created in Bangalore remain occupied with only 20 to 30 percent. And this is the case in Mumbai and Chandigarh as well. And it's not just the case in Indian cities. Even Copenhagen, despite reducing on-street parking, the multi-level car parks in the city have only about 25 to 30 percent occupancy rate. In London, Peckham levels, this is an example, where a multi-level car park which has not been used well has been transformed for community activities. So our imagination that multi-level car parks would solve our parking woes is a big myth. In order to solve our parking problem, we need to manage, price, and enforce on-street parking. And while we think about building MLCPs, it's important to understand that one parking space with about 250, which is about 250 square feet with uh, the associated driveway, is actually the space required for one house of the economically weaker section, for an office for four people, or as a dining space for 15 people. And the last minute. When we think about creating density around the, multi multi around the mass rapid transit systems in our cities, we fear to do so because of the scare of creating more congestion. But the truth is that density does not cause congestion. Parking does. When we create buildings with a third of them dedicated to creating car parks, these car parks would attract more cars to them, creating bigger traffic jams. But cities like London have buildings such as the Shard and the Gherkin with just a handful of car parks for the disabled. So adopting parking maximums create a ceiling for the amount of parking included in the new development and thereby the number of cars that are actually attracted to the neighborhoods in which these buildings stand. So what should cities do going forward? Firstly, cities should manage on-street parking. Instead of having unmanaged curbs, cities should draw out the uh, parking on their streets and dedicate space for all users, for pedestrians, cyclists, and look at parking as only one of the different uses for which the street is put to use. Most often, it's best to have parallel car parking instead of perpendicular par car parking. Next, it's very important for us to price parking effectively. This is a case of London in the 1950s when parking was not priced. As you can see in the left hand, uh, the left corner image, even in London, double parking was commonly, was commonly seen. But when the city introduced parking meters and priced the parking on streets, then the demand reduced and further, when they quadrupled the prices, the demand reduced further. Today, looking at the prices at, uh, in Indian cities, here is a graph that shows that we charge very less for parking in our <coughs> cities. Cities like London and Tokyo charge as much as 60 times more for parking on our precious road space. So what should we do? current scenario, our parking is unregulated and not priced. But we should manage public on-street parking by first charging the on-street parking higher than the prices that we have for our multi-level car parks. 
So when the demand for parking is high, what we need to do is increase pricing and not create more supply. And parking has a cost. We need to know that it would vary anywhere between 20 to 60 rupees per hour. And finally, the money that has been collected from parking needs to be invested in better sustainable transportation. This is an example of Barcelona where biking, the public cycle sharing program is financed entirely by its parking revenue. London, the Freedom Pass, which actually allows their elderly and disabled rights to use public transport for free is funded by the parking fees collected by its on-street parking uh, management system. So let's take a quick look at a couple of case studies. Um, uh, so ITDP has been working with uh, multiple cities across the last decade. And I'm going to just share very briefly some of our successes in two cities. Ranchi. So in Ranchi, the MG Road, uh, which is their main commercial center, um, has been selected for piloting parking. Now here, the street has been divided into three zones. Um, the first is the orange zone, where there is a high demand um, and where, which has very high commercial activity, where the prices are as high as 40 rupees per hour. The second zone with medium demand and medium occupancy has been charged 30 rupees for two hours and areas with lower demand have been charged about 20 rupees for, uh, for three hours. This has increased the revenue for the city from 1 million a year to 12 million a year. And inspired by the city, the state of Jharkhand has now adopted a progressive parking policy. Let's very quickly take a look at Chennai. Now, Chennai has recently launched the parking management system for 12,000 car parking slots. Charges in the city vary from 20 to rupees 40 per slot. This is an app-based system with real-time information of parking um, in the city. Um, enforcement is also being done using uh, technology. And one of the big successes in the system is that unlike the previous model of just leasing the area out to the service provider, the service provider now is paid by the amount required to manage, per, manage parking per slot. Also, the information and the data that has been collected uh, from, this, uh, the, uh, from this management system would be used to adjust the rates of parking. So when parking demand increases to 80 to 90% in a street, the rate in that street would be increased. And if the parking demand is between 60 to 70%, the parking charges would be decreased. So let's create cities where we, let's create parks and not parking. Before we end, I'd like to ask you, what would you choose? Would you like to create a dead city that is flooded with cars? Or would you like to create a vibrant city for people? Thank you so much, everyone, for being a part of this particular webinar. I'd like um, to thank the team of ITDP um, because this particular presentation has been put together by multiple people across the years. So Shreya Gadipalli, Chris Kost, Ranga Rohini, Nashwa Naushad, Ven Gopal, Pareen, and many others in our team who've helped us at various points in different parts of uh, the last decade to put this presentation together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ashwati, for that very, very enlightening presentation. 
Um, so uh, I see about 35 of you have participated in the polls. Thank you all for participating. And we'll share the results of the poll. Of the poll. So by the looks of it, okay, so let's just go, go, go over it one by one. So how do, you, uh, so how do we solve the issue of parking? And about 49% of you have said that none of the above are the proper means of, park, uh, of you know, solving the issue of parking. So I'm sure Ashwati is going to be very happy with that result. And um, also all of you voted to not uh, pave the parks uh, to create parking. So that's great. And is it morally, morally right to price parking? And all of you said yes. So it looks like we have a very informed audience. But I hope that um, I'm sure that Ashwati's presentation has actually confirmed your beliefs in uh, the parking policy going forward. Thank you so much, Ashwati, for that. Anumita, um, I now pass on the baton to you. Please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you, Archana. Could you uh, start by sharing your slide? Yes, I'm just Please. doing that. Can you see my presentation now? Yes, Anumita, we can. So I be do I begin now? Yes, Anuta, go ahead, go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Archana and um, Ashwati. That was uh, really an amazing and a very good presentation. Um, and uh, the most exciting part about this is that you have already laid down the key guiding principles of what uh, it takes to make the most appropriate and effective parking policy as a demand management tool. And uh, so you have already set the framework for the discussion and uh, what we are all looking forward to in this conversation. Let me therefore bring in this very exciting moment in Delhi right now, because uh, as you have just heard that Delhi has just notified the first ever parking rules. And uh, this for the first time gives the legislative backing to implementation of parking policy in the city. So, Let's understand what that really means and how this has really created a big opportunity for the city to address several issues that uh, Ashwati has already uh, 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 talked about. So uh, I'm just trying to uh, change my slide. Uh, yeah. So first, very quickly to connect with what Ashwati has said, that this discussion certainly has to begin with the clear assumption that free parking on public land and on street, uh, this idea that it's a public and fundamental right and that the government should provide it is certainly absolutely wrong. We are talking about parking in is as a private need of the private individuals and in the public and the private realm. And therefore this has to be, parking has to be rented and priced. And as we know that the parking is one of the most wasteful use of cars and knowing that 96% of the time it just stands parked somewhere, that puts enormous pressure on the streets, the public space. And today, the situation has come to such in Delhi that we are devoting more land to parking than uh, finding new land to house the poor of the city. So uh, it's strange and a paradoxical that in this city today, for any other usage of uh, public land, whether it's for social events, for hawking, for, uh, for right, night shelters for the poor, you need permission, you need to make some payment. But parking in most parts is free. And what we are finding at the same time, that because of the whole residential parking and the nighttime parking becoming a big issue in the city, that is inducing more and more gated development. People are just putting gates all around their colonies, which is directly in conflict with safe, direct access that people need for a walkable, accessible city. And that's kind of messing up with the whole compact city development that we're all looking forward to. Now, from that perspective, 
we are also seeing that now when for the first time we, are, we want to change the whole policy narrative and the way we are going to design our cities going forward. But because there is a very poor understanding of what it means and what these new policies are trying to achieve, we see a lot of popular resistance against the new emerging ideas and parking is fundamental to many of those resistance. So for instance, now in Delhi, we are talking about uh, transit-oriented development. We are talking about compact city, compact design, urban design. And wherever now Delhi is trying to go for redevelopment or new development, we do see local popular protest, mainly because people are fearful, because as they see, as they perceive that there is going to be high density development, uh, there's going to be more commercial development, they immediately assume, and rightly so under the current framework, that it is going to increase the parking demand and also traffic pressure in the area. So, but then we also know now from the new policies that have been designed for the uh, city and for the country, for instance, the transit-oriented development policy, that within that framework, it is possible to plan redevelopment in a way that you can do this, you can have a high-density mixed-use development, but at the same time, you can reduce demand for parking. And there are ways of doing it. So while you're improving and promoting safe public access to public transport, you can, by design, reduce demand for parking. But because this is not well understood, because this criteria and elements are not well integrated with the new new development projects. So clearly, therefore, they are in line of fire. And as Ashwati has already pointed out, that Delhi today has become a serious, parking has become a serious law and order problem. So since 2009, as we have started to document, in some part of the city, somebody is killing somebody because of the scuffle over parking. And it's a scary, scary neighborhood conflict that is taking shape. So there is clearly a congestion impact, pollution impact, law and order impact, the, and it's kind of dividing neighborhoods. So it's a, too much of a price to pay for the right to park. And clearly, as we will understand, that the right to park is something totally different from what everyone understands. So within this context, what is this exciting development that has happened in Delhi just last week? So Delhi has now notified in, on September 23rd the new rules and the guidelines for preparing parking area management plan. And it's important to note that this has been notified under the Central Motor Vehicle Act, where there was already a provision available under which the state government could actually notify this. Now, the, the rules which were originally framed by the committee set up under the Honorable, uh, the Lieutenant Governor, now, uh, so, uh, so you, what you really need to understand where the triggers are coming from. So one, that the uh, rules were framed by the committee, and then the requirement of parking as a demand management tool was also the part of the comprehensive cleaner action plan, which was also notified last year. And that all requires parking rules and management as a demand management tool to reduce air pollution in the city. So therefore, parking policy has taken shape not only to uh, deal with the, uh, the chaos, the parking chaos and congestion, but this is also seen as a major vehicle restraint measure and a mobility strategy to reduce air pollution in, you know, in one of the most polluted cities in the country. But the very important message of this development is that with this notification, this is the first ever where we're getting the legislative backing, a backup for the parking management for a vehicle restraint measure in the city. Now, this development is critical, but it is also very important for people to understand that this has not happened overnight. It is a battle that the city has fought over the last 10 years, more than 10 years. And for us, this began way back in 2005, when after the initial success of some of the measures in Delhi to stabilize air pollution, the next critical question that came up was that, how are we going to deal with explosive number of the personal vehicles and the usage? Now from then, from 
that point, uh, when the Supreme Court had asked for restraint measures, and then from so 2005, 2006, and finally, so there's various steps, the policies have started to take shape. And uh, it's important for you to know that not only at the Delhi level, but also at the national level, the national urban transfer policy had also brought in the key principles of the uh, uh, saying that the use that the parking has to be used as a restraint measure by limiting availability of parking space and with very high parking fees to curb use of personal vehicles. Subsequently, in, uh, the, in 20, around 2012, 2014, around that time, when the master plan of Delhi was also further amended, and at that point of time, it adopted the idea of the parking management district. And it said that we now need to take a comprehensive view that while you are prioritizing the needs of all the road users, that you still need to develop a parking policy as a restraint measure. And finally, the transit-oriented development policy that came recently. So clearly, that's the policies have been evolving, but there has been a clear battle in the city because initially, the parking as a demand management tool was not well understood and was hugely registered. So all the initial plans that were coming in were supply-driven. So those were all about how many more multi-level parking structures can be built, how can we keep looking for more land to provide for more parking, that was the narrative. But now with this particular law and the rule, this narrative has changed completely and dramatically. Now, so what are we really talking about? So what, how is the life changing with the new rules? So if you say, so the rules are now saying that you need across all neighborhoods of Delhi, an area plan, a parking area management plan, and so, which essentially means that you will delineate and park an area, a district, and you will prepare the plan for that area. This is a dramatic shift from the original idea that where we only went for spot fixing. And earlier, we would only look at um, a very congested spot and say, oh, there's a huge accumulation of parking here. So let's just put up one multi-level parking to suck away the parking from the streets. But now what they're saying is, no, that's not the solution. What you have to do, take an area, delineate the boundary of that area, and then after demarcating that area, and you have to identify and inventorize that how the accumulation of parking is happening on street, off street, multi-level parking facilities, and identify all available public institutional parking facilities in that area. Then identify the other usage on the road, the vending, multimodal integration points of the uh, public transport nodes. Identify the green and open areas, the parks, the pedestrian areas, the footpaths, energy corridors, and the, you know, so all of these will have to be first identified on a map for that area. And while doing that, this is going to be a hugely participatory process. Here, the urban local bodies will be preparing this plan along with the resident welfare association and local residents and the shopkeeper association and, the, and all the other concerned govern, governing bodies. And this is going to be a huge opportunity where the community is going to connect to understand the local challenge and find the local solution to the local problem. And that's, I think, is the most exciting part of this. Now, the rules are very categorical, saying that when you are through this planning process, trying to identify where you can provide the legal parking, there has to be some non-negotiable no-go areas, which means the plan should not allow any parking on the footpaths, no parking in parks and green areas. There, in all roads, you'll have to leave at least one lane completely free of encroachment for emergency vehicle to move anytime during the day and night. On street parking will not be allowed close to the intersection, bus stops, off street facilities and long duration parking and off street facilities will be provided wherever you're trying to reorganize the on street parking, but link it with shuttle. And then uh, uh, the whole 
multi-level parking, if they exist or if they are required according to the plan, then that will have to be well integrated with the area plan. So like this, they have identified several of these. So when you are applying these rules, you have to apply these rules in your neighborhood to be able to come up with a plan. And the most dramatic improvement that we are going to see is that for the first time, the park plan is saying that the plan is just not about parking, but it is about complete street management. So the rules are actually saying that parking area plan will have to address the need of all road users and in the order of priority. So which means when you're designing the road, you have to account for the pedestrians, cyclists, public transport users, multimodal integration, paratransit, pick up and drop off points, hawking zones, resting areas. All of these interests will have to be balanced. And while doing this, we will have to follow the uh, relevant uh, design guidelines of the Indian Road Congress or DDL UTPEC. So these rules are absolutely clear on this. The, the most contentious part of when the rules were getting finalized and framed was the residential parking part. Now, some of the key drivers for the residential parking areas of the neighborhoods, as I said, will be about that whatever you do, you have to keep a lane completely free from ambulance, fire tenders, and police vehicles for emergency vehicle. No green, uh, parking in green areas, parks, and footpaths, as I said. Now, the moment you bring this method in the badness, it will be a very important opportunity then to understand uh, what is the potential and where you need the cap on parking. The rules are also very clear on the pricing. It is given a formula now for the base price and the dynamic barrier pricing. It is talking about differential pricing. It is also saying that when you are managing the off-street and the on-street parking and through the area management plan, you need to incentivize the off-street over on-street. And on-street has to be more convenient and therefore priced higher. So uh, like this, a lot of these, uh, there is going to be a penalty for violation, illegal parking, and uh, the uh, and the, the prices schemes are going to be uh, done in a way that it can certainly influence the demand and the behavior. But as you know, that uh, from, from the original proposal, some of the specific provisions on residential parking uh, uh, pricing have been withheld. But we feel that uh, it will certainly come back because we will realize that once we begin to delimit the legal parking area, then it will have to be offered at a price. Now, the big opportunity that now has been created is that the, even though the rules were framed, but it took some time, more than two years, to get these rules uh, implemented, but uh, to get them notified. But here, the Supreme Court of India has played a very important role of a catalyst. So the Supreme Court intervention has uh, helped to hurry up the notification of the rules and the guidelines. And now going forward, Supreme Court has given very clear directives to the committee and the authority, uh, which is Environment Pollution Control and Prevention Authority, that they have now been asked that based on the rules, what they have to do is to monitor implementation of first three key pilot projects in three critical areas of Delhi. And these areas are uh, mixed use. They, are, they have a residential component, mixed use component. They have commercial component. And these pilot uh, plans, which have already been prepared, now they will have to be implemented by December 30th. And the lessons from this will be used to scale up implementation for the entire city. Now, why they are going to be doing this simultaneously, EPCA has been directed to monitor implementation of parking strategies for multimodal integration of the key metro stations. So the DMRC has already framed about the uh, multimodal integration plan for about 70 metro stations in Delhi and which have been approved by UTPEC DDA. Now these are about that how are you going to integrate parking with the multimodal integration? And here it's just not about private vehicles. It is also about the paratransit, the buses, how the parking of these vehicles will be 
designed and organized around metro stations for multimodal integration. And the third component, which is going to get monitored now, is about the, the technology and the IT application for, the, for parking guidance, for, uh, for, for high-level, more advanced management of parking lots. So therefore, clearly now, this has opened up very new and very big opportunity for the city to see some massive transformation in the future. The, um, the big interesting part of the whole exercise is that already what we are seeing in the pilot areas, that the local residents are now getting very deeply involved with the process. So people who earlier thought that the, the land available in their area is infinite, that they can just go and park everywhere. So now when they are taking the rules and they're looking at their own neighborhood, they are realizing what is possible and what is not possible. It's a great way to sensitize local residents about the potential, about the parking cap. They have to understand that there is a limit within which they will have to operate. So to just to give you one clear example, so one pilot project in Lajpat Nagar 3, where after applying all the rules, they found that there are more than 3,000 cars. Now, when they applied the rules and prepared the plan, they found that they could accommodate about 1,830 cars. Now, the excess cars therefore had to go to shared parking facilities just outside the limit of that area. Now, uh, uh, this also clearly brought out the moment this happened, now we find that the residents are now getting even more deeply involved. They're recounting the car numbers in the area. They're still trying to find uh, vacant areas, back alleys to accommodate more cars. But they also know very clearly they cannot breach certain conditions. And it is also clear to everyone that they might be able to accommodate some of the excess cars now, but the moment this plan gets frozen, then it puts a limit to how many more cars that can come into that neighborhood. I think that's the most important part of this whole exercise. So some of these drawings that have happened and this visualization that are, I'm just giving an example. But the critical part of this is that the simple things that now you have to demarcate. Demarcate on, uh, the, on the uh, street, on land, everywhere, then where are you allowing legal parking? And that's uh, what is going to happen. The third element is that because we know that the multi-level parking still remained a huge, uh, that is, is an obsession, and that the policymakers have been thinking only about this, that only multi-level parking can solve the situation. But now this will also have to operate within the framework of area plan. So as we know that the, when they looked around at the, the multi-level car parks, they're not very really well managed system today. So because they are treated in isolation, so you can see that these multi-level parks that have been built, they remain um, uh, underutilized. And uh, so uh, you have uh, these, uh, the, uh, the, the inside the multi-level, which Ashwati actually showed you, they remain vacant, whereas the surface still is chock a block. And this management will now, this integrated management will now become very critical. So uh, there's a huge opportunity in using the area plan approach to pedestrianize some parts of this and people can park and walk. That, but then it's a very poor management at this stage. The one last point that I really want to kind of say that while parking area management is now helping us to develop and to connect with all the residents in the neighborhoods, and we will now be able to bring some organization and method in the chaos that has taken over the city. But there is still a huge, huge resistance to the idea of pricing uh, of in the residential areas, because even now there is no clarity about what kind of pricing of residential parking permit is all about, because that has not been spelled out yet. But what is fascinating is that as part of this rulemaking, when we create, we had carried out surveys in Delhi, we were stunned and surprised to see that there are several location, uh, localities and department blocks where the Resident Welfare Association have already started charging uh, for parking informally. And these are some of the examples. This is one uh, apartment block in Sake where they charge monthly subscription based on size of the flat and number of cars owned. Uh, so this is already happening in Delhi. And even outside, what we have found 
uh, that for a long time we thought that perhaps the current multi-level parking is being used only for commercial and daytime parking. But when we went inside, we found that the local, the localities around the multi-level parking, they have actually started using this multi-level car parks even for residential nighttime parking. And they are paying the rates already. So some are paying daily rates, some are paying monthly rates, but they are paying the charge, the official charge in this. So clearly it's happening already. And uh, so this is not only multi-level park, even on surface parking. This is behind the Alaknanda market, where the nighttime parking in this legal area, surface area, is happening where people are paying for residential parking. So why are we creating two sets of citizens? Some are paying and some are not paying. And if the uh, community is already charging, so the urban local body should be able to come up with the right rates for the residential parking. Now, the other big change that we are going to see is the approach, it is the whole complete street approach that you can see here already. That is just not about parking, but it's also about uh, uh, taking care of the needs of the other road users. And the very recently, this very important development in Delhi, where we are now moving towards pedestrianizing some of the key commercial streets, they are also mixed use streets. And here, like the Ajmantha Road in Delhi, where they have completely pedestrianized it now. And the, and the critical approach and the strategy for this has been to remove the parking from this area. And it has shown a dramatic results in terms of livability, usability, and even in terms of exposure to local air pollution. So these are some of the big changes that we are looking for. The parking rules, and this is the most direct and very important part and element of the rules, that the rules are now legally allowing parking revenue to be invested for local area improvement. So this is now legal. And therefore, this is going to open up a big opportunity because the urban local bodies otherwise hard pressed, not with, the, not with enough budget. And if RWS take over some of the responsibility, then the, the part of the revenue uh, can then be reinvested for local area improvement. And we have seen in different parts of the world that how by charging for parking, the, the, the local government has actually conveyed to the people that the charge that they are taking from people, how the revenue from that will be used for the improvement of their area. These are very, very, very important examples that we are looking at. Finally, what I just want to conclude by saying that today parking management as a a demand management tool as a vehicle restraint tool, as an air pollution control tool, has become absolutely necessary in all our cities. But to be able to uh, push for this strategy, we have to ensure that people understand the strategy and there is a public support for this strategy. And they need to understand that a policy like this is going to benefit not only the car user for whom then the parking becomes so much more organized, the predictability of finding parking space becomes so much easier. So it's certainly helping the uh, car users, but it's also using the non-car users, in fact, it's helping the non-car users even more. So they get freed up walking space, good access, safe access. It kind of improves their visibility, accessibility, safety, uh, and life is without encroachment. So we have to we give out this message to people that how the city benefits overall, how city becomes livable because of this. And the moment we begin to enforce this, uh, the reason why we are saying that this is a demand management tool, it's mainly because with this kind of development, it is going to force a lot of personal decisions for behavioral change. So it's not that the moment this comes into force, you're just going to leave your car behind and hop onto the metro or a bus, but you are going to take whole range of decisions that are going to reduce your car usage and car trips. So you may combine your trips to reduce several individual trips. You may avoid peak time. You may share the car with the family members and colleagues. You may look for cheaper parking areas off street. You may take auto or a taxi or share transport, ride share some of those. You may just walk and cycle within a certain distance. You may take a metro or a bus. And also, if you're a long-term parker, and you may park and ride or park and walk, and you reduce parking duration and, and so much more. So it kind of is going to unleash a whole range of decisions 
uh, uh, at the individual level, which is going to have huge impact and give you the desired effect. So my final slide is to say that parking as a restraint measure is part of the larger mobility action for clean air. And therefore, while we are all asking for improving public transport strategy, non-motorized strategy, multimodal integration, all of those must happen. But even those cannot be successful if you do not have the restraint measured in place. And my final line is that it's important that people understand, support this, push this, make it happen, and not create barrier and uh, create the problem and, and People have to understand that you know it's just not possible to continue the way things are happening right now is unsustainable. And the final punch line is that the free infinite parking will never give you clean air and save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Anamita, for that really painting such a vivid picture of the parking policy. And it shows as, as an architect of one of the architects of the policy, it, you've really brought us so much clarity into what is happening in Delhi and, uh, and the steps forward. So thank you so much for that. So with that, we, we come to the end of the discussion and we are going to go into the a Q and A session, the question and answer session. So all the participants can take about a minute or two to add questions to the Q and A chat box. We'll, but in the interest of time, we, uh, I'll direct one question and we can start the discussion by the first question, taking an anonymous attendee's question forward and even Vignesh's question forward, saying that now that Delhi has a parking policy, what, how does it, what is the significance for other cities like Chennai or Pune who are on the path? How does this apply to other cities as well? Maybe Ashwati, you can take the lead on this discussion and then we'll come back to Anumita. So Archana, I think this is a, it's, it's a great step in the right direction. But as Anumita mentioned, the Supreme Court played a very key role in ensuring that this policy actually gets notified um, in Delhi. So various other cities, so for example, uh, Pune uh, had a, a year back, got its parking policy to the very last stage where it had to get notified. And it has been, it has remained in that point for the last one year. And in that sense, political will actually plays a very, very critical role um, in such situations. So it's very important for us to try and ensure that we keep this battle um, as a more technical one and keep this away from being political. So there's an important, there's a, uh, while cities, there are multiple cities that have actually got inspired by Delhi. We recently read an article of Bangalore actually uh, taking steps to uh, get the parking policy adopted. So I'm sure that this particular step would inspire many cities to do the same. But I think all of us have a very critical role to play to actually use uh, to leverage the situation and nudge and push the cities that we are working on uh, to take the right step forward. Anumita, do you have anything more to add to that? Just to say that the, um, the key difference here is that uh, what Delhi understood that only a policy framework will not enable action. So that's the reason why they were so keen on getting rules and notify the rules. So that gives it the legal backing. So um, that's where we really need to see a lot more cities moving forward. And I now know that currently, in because if the parking policy has got very deeply linked now with the clean air action plans, and right now under the National Clean Air Program, about 122 cities are making their plans. At least I know some cities uh, uh, who are also including parking policy and rules as part of their clean air action plan, which opens up the opportunity for uh, to make it an enforceable strategy. So that's where we really have to push for and also keep looking for good practices that are emerging in other cities of India as well. And my favorite is that some of the landlocked small hill cities like uh, Gangtok, like Shimla, who have already notified proof of parking uh, requirement 
uh, to for the purchase of cars in those cities because they are so landlocked with such limited land area. So if they are being able to do this, then why you know other cities should lag behind? But as I said, that one of the the key barrier to this approach is the opposition from the car owners themselves, and that's middle class environmentalism, which which otherwise will you know worried about dirty air, concerned about congestion investing in uh, um, uh, you know, the masks and air purifier. Now, if they don't want to pay for parking or go for organized parking, you know, that kind of paradox you know, cannot exist. So we really have to build a lot more awareness among people so that we can get strong public support for this hard decision. That's the only way to break political resistance. Thank you, Anambita. That Thank you both of you for that very enlightening answer. Going on to the next question, um, Kiran Deep Kaur asks, how can we bring a change in regulation for parking minimums? Animita, would you like to take a lead on that answer? I think um, it's, a, again, it's the same thing. Um, it's, a, um, I guess now the cities need to adopt a comprehensive uh, parking policy and rules. And within that, they can uh, provide for uh, this kind of and move away from the current uh, parking minimum approach that we have. So, uh, in fact, even though the daily rules do not exactly say uh, fix the parking maximum, but the way parking area management is going to be designed, it is going to be about parking maximum. So, uh, the question is that therefore the cities need to detail out, the devil is in the detail, and they should frame it very quickly and then make it enforceable. Understood. So, moving on to the third question quickly, uh, Ashwati, maybe you could take a lead on this. Without adequate alternatives to, to in the form of public transportation in most cities, would pricing parking be effective? Someone asks. Yeah. So for this question, it's important to actually for us, like I said in my presentation, to understand how people are actually traveling today. So, you know, um, a third of people actually walk or cycle in our cities and another third use public transportation. And they are doing this under very, very precarious situations because parking uh, on street parking is actually encroaching that space. So hence, it's very important for us, even in our current, um, even with the current state of public transportation, it is important for us to price parking and manage our on street parking such that the users who are using it today can actually use it more safely and comfortably. And secondly, about, um, you know, thinking about how this shift would happen. You know, if you're pricing people and you want them to shift to public transport, but, you know, uh, if the complaint is that public transport is actually in a poor condition, I think it's a question of, it's a, it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. These improvements need to be made together and comprehensively. It does not mean that we do not improve, uh, improve public transportation while we create uh, or uh, while we implement these parking changes. So these are um, issues that need to be handled simultaneously and not one after the other. Thank you for that, Ashwati. So Animita, the next question is directed to you. Uh, someone and anon another anonymous attendee asked, specifically for Delhi, safety is one of the reasons why people are not able to ditch cars or not use cars. So can we see parking reforms in isolation alone? I'm, I'm actually very surprised by this question because even today in Delhi, if you look at the modal share, it's about 15 to 20% that, that are car trips. Okay, which means the majority in the city are either, either walking, cycling, using a bus or a metro. Now, if they, I mean, if the safety, I would assume, if uh, why it's so special for the car users. And uh, uh, we have to make cities safe for everyone, not just for car users. And to say that to be safe, we have to buy a car, then it's kind of taking the narrative somewhere else, and that's the wrong direction. So we have to fight for safety, 
and uh, safety in so many different sense, safety from crime uh, and also uh, uh, from road accidents. And the cars do contribute hugely to road accidents. So, uh, so how do you define safety and safety for whom? So if the majority in the city are using, uh, are walking, cycling, using public transport, make cities safe for everyone. And if the city is designed for safety with eye on the street for everyone, then it's, uh, then you have just won the game because more you make the city uh, or design the city for the convenience of the car owners, then you are removing by design the eye on the street, people on the street. You actually make your roads more unsafe. If you look at all the crime that are getting committed now, targeting cars, these are all these isolated car centric, multiple lane roads of Delhi today. So don't think sitting inside a car makes you safer than others. Well, that was a very, very powerful answer. So thank you so much for that, Anamita. Taking our last question for the for today. So someone asks whether there should be a centralized management for parking facilities throughout the city because they've experienced very deserted parking management, parking buildings, and I'm guessing these are also MLCPs. So they're asked if there should be a separate centralized management uh, for parking facilities in the city. Ashwati, would you like to take a lead on that answer? Yeah. So when we uh, talk about the parking issues, we tend to believe that, you know, uh, certain, for example, uh, certain streets may be extremely uh, choked up with parking while the streets around, um, you know, there might be a localized parking problem while in the area there would be a lot of parking available. Similarly, when we talk about off street parking facilities as well, today the situation is that because of our parking minimum requirement, many of our residential buildings have parking which are used at night, but during the daytime, they remain inefficiently used, although a lot of money has been put towards that particular infrastructure. Similarly, we might have multiple malls that have been created with a lot of parking supply. Today, those malls, there may be a few malls which are not using its parking uh, most efficiently. And we also have publicly created MLCPs that may not be uh, used efficiently. So it's definitely a good idea in order to have a centralized management of all of these parking systems such that the entire supply comes into one portal. So wouldn't it be a great idea that, you know, um, when you are leaving or when you're about to reach a destination to know all the different types of parking that's actually available within that particular vicinity and then you can make a choice as to whether you want to park your car with a bit of a higher charge on the street or maybe choose which kind of uh, off-street publicly accessible parking that you would like uh, to use. So uh, this is a great idea, but there is a lot that needs to be done on that front. Um, and let's see how we work towards uh, um, implementing something like this. In fact, actually, if I may add to that, want to add to that, if yeah, just add that essentially the way our uh, Aswati has just uh, defined it in a city. Uh, yeah. So uh, the way Aswati has just uh, defined, so that exactly what the parking area management plans in Delhi require uh, the urban local bodies to do. So they are saying, so, the, so the, the rules are saying don't do management of parking lots in isolation. Do them in, uh, so it has to be an integrated management of, of the delineated area where as she has said that you identify all the parking lots and look for public shared parking facility so that you can unlock the, all the uh, parking that you've created that can be used optimally by all users and also between different peak users. So uh, that clearly what it is and, uh, and certainly the, uh, the rules have also given the centralized management structure for the city as well to oversee there's all these area parking management integrated plans that are now going to come up across the city, which will include all the different types of parking facilities.
Okay, okay, Anumita. Thank you so much. Five. Bye bye. So to just uh, close on that last question, so removing parking minimums and creating parking as standalone facilities would actually allow us to create this parking pool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anumita and Ashwati for that amazing discussion on parking. Thank you all participants for attending episode five of Urban Log webinar series. Do keep coming back. We always, we really overwhelmed with the kind of responses that we're getting. So please do come back for our next webinars coming forward. The next webinar will be on the great Indian electric wave. On a parting note, Thank you so much. And as you close your discussion, you will be uh, redirected to the feedback survey. So your feedbacks are very, very valuable to us because we're able to incorporate them in our for upcoming webinars uh, series. And we're getting, we're able to direct, directly hear from you, your thoughts. So thank you so much, everyone, and have a nice day. Thank you.